Okay, so we're here with uh, Dave Shondell, and uh, you know, part of the deal is when as coaches we want to teach kids how to perform individual skills, but then the other part of the, the equation is how do you blend those skills into a system? Um, and, and Dave's going to talk today a little bit about designing an efficient and effective team defensive system using the attributes, hiding your liabilities, mm -hmm. things to, uh, to consider when you're designing a defense. So it's not just a cookie cutter defense that you saw on TV, it's something that you know, might uh, meet your, the, the needs of your personnel and allow for some team success. So with that lengthy and clumsy introduction, mm -hmm. Um, Dave, what, what are the, the thought sequences you go through or items that you consider when you're trying to connect the dots and design a team defense? Well, every year is different, for one thing. And we are not the same defensive team we had a year ago. In terms of skill or the system that you're going to play or both? First of all, the personnel, the, the okay. ability level. Uh, you know, a year ago we lost two fine defensive players and passers, Emily Ehlers and Blair Basham. One was a libero, one was a, a DS. They'd started for three years. They, they were pretty good. And Tiffany Fisher was one of our middles, so you lose an experienced middle. So now you've got to look at the group you've got coming in and what are you going to do to be successful? And I, you know, and I look at what Russ did when he won the four national championships in a row. And he did a great job, I think, of knowing when he could play his big people all the way around and also plugging in those great little ball control players. And I think that that's been kind of a pattern that a lot of people would like to follow. They just, they just don't have the big people like Russ had or the little people like, like he had uh, on a regular basis. But um, I think that, I'm going to throw another name out, it's like Mike Hebert was the best in the business from year to year of taking his team, whether it be on offense or defense or serve, receive, whatever else, and this is how we can be successful. This is what we're going to have to do, whether it means, okay, we're going to run a two-setter offense now because I've got these two people that can set and hit and I can't take them off the floor and things like that. But I think that we've worked really hard at doing the same thing, and that's why we're three days away from getting ready to play, and we're not even sure yet what lineup we're going to put on the floor because we're still in the process of figuring out what's going to work because it isn't a cookie-cutter operation where you just plug people in. Um, so when you say figuring out what's going to work, does that mean you, you try a lot of different things in the context of your practices and different systems and people playing different spots and seeing what's working or not? Well, working? certainly at the high school level, it's a much bigger challenge. At the college level, you've got enough big bodies. You're not having to, uh, to block with just two people. You know, and, and you, know, you know me well enough to know that I was at, at some schools that in high school that didn't have a plethora of talent. And you know, we designed a lot of different things. I, when I was at Daleville, on the team that was actually ranked number one in the state in 1988, I realized that's a long time ago. People weren't even, a lot of our people weren't even born then. But in 1988, we used what was called a two block system. I had a setter, great setter, who was uh, about 5'5", five, five, and I had an incredible defensive player who was about 5'4" probably the first real libero before liberos were liberos. She played middle back all six rotations, okay? And the setter played right behind the block all six rotations. And we had our middles about 10 feet in from the right side line and our left sides were about 10 feet in from the left side line. And if somebody ran quick offense against us, we had to be prepared for that, how we we're going to def defend it. We would, depending on how good their left was or their right was, we would make adjustments to that. But normally most teams back then ran a, a two ball in the middle and high on the outside. And so if, if they set a two ball in the middle, they both shuffled in and would block there. If they'd set the ball to the left side, then our, our, our middle would go out and block. But the theory was at that, at that level, and I don't think it's changed a whole lot, is more defenders are better than more blockers in high school volleyball. Uh, you've got a lot of people wasting their time blocking in high school volleyball just getting used and giving the, the, the attacker opportunities right. to score easy points and in the net and everything else. Um, but that was kind of, you know, probably the, the, the epitome of designing a defense around your personnel. But we did that consistently in the, at the high school stage when my daughter, uh, Lindsay, was a setter at Muncie Central. Um, she was about five foot, four and a half on a good day. And there'd be some days we would leave her up at the net 
but there'd be other times that you know she knew she she was going to drop off. And we played John's team at Newcastle. They had Kimmy Freeberg that won a national championship at USC. And I made the mistake of during the regular season designing a defense to shut down the five-one setter Kimmy Freeberg. And that was that our right front player when, when Lindsay was right front, she was she was dropping off the net. Okay, she started the net, then she'd drop off. Freeberg would dump the ball. She'd play it. We had another setter that would step in, set the ball, and and we hammered them during the regular season. Problem was. They were well enough coached that by the end of the year, they were ready for that system. And so, you know, it didn't work quite as well the second time through. But I think that not only does your defensive system have to work for the, your team, you have to know who you're playing as well. And I go back to how many times I would watch Steve play at Burris when I knew I had to beat them to win the sectional. And our defense would be designed to beat Burris. I mean, that, that was who we had to beat to, to advance on. If we would advance on, we probably had a, a good run at the state championship. So, And you did that with the idea of if this, if this works against Burris, it's probably going to work against the sure, teams. That we sure, sure. Yeah, they're, they're the best team in the state. And, but, uh, you know, we, there are years where they would be very difficult to stop if you didn't have a, a good blocker in every position. But there are other years where you could be smart enough to say, okay, we're going to put two here, we're going to put two here. If you want to set your right side player, go set her. You know, and so you're forcing teams to do things they don't want to do. And the same thing would go if you, know, you, if you, if you drop off your right side player, teams have a tendency then, okay, we're going to set our left side hitter. Well, that may not be their best player, but that's where they're going to go with the ball. So you have to try to use that to your advantage uh, as best you can. But you know, this year's team at Purdue, um, we have a great libero. Carly Kramer is, is one of the best in the country. So we have to find a way to make her a huge part of our defense. And so when we design our defense now, going into the season, it's that we're going to block the line on the left side hitter, which is worth 70 to 75% of the game is still played at the college level, and we're channeling that ball to Kramer to make plays. If, if we didn't have a great libero, then we may be moving the block inside and forcing people to hit line. So you know, those are some little things about what you have to do, but you have to look at, at – What's going to work for you? Like, right, we want to be prepared to run two defenses this year, play two systems, a 5-1, and we run a 5-1. We have a, I wouldn't consider her a small setter because Rachel's six foot tall, but she doesn't touch 10-1 or 10-2. So she's somewhat of a blocking liability like most setters in, the, in college volleyball are. But if we're playing Minnesota and they're going to put maybe Dixon on the left side, and they're going to put Whitman on the left side, and they're going to set every ball out there. Half the time, I've got Rachel Davis out there blocking. But if I run a 6-2 against them and have Rachel just play in the back row and then put maybe a 6-foot, 4-inch freshman in the game for her, defensively, that makes up for not being able to do that. So I want to be this year prepared to do two different things. Now, how well that will work, I don't know. It's like having two quarterbacks in football, you know. Um, sounds like a great idea, but you lose some cohesion and chemistry and the same person's not setting the ball the same tempo all the time. And I think that's one of the concerns. I think everything being equal, and people have asked me that this year, would you rather have one set or two? And I think everything being equal, you'd like to have one on offense because that's going to make your, your team run smoother. But defensively, we want to be able to run a system well enough that we can put a bigger block. And if we run a 6-2, I think we can be athletic across the front row as anybody in the country. So that's, that's all part of it. Marv Dumphy, um, the men's coach at Pepperdine, had a coaching philosophy, and I'm interested in, in your reaction to it. So many coaches say, well, this is my best left side hitter, so therefore she'll block left side too. Um, so if we dig a ball, I got my best hitter ready to hit. And at the time, Marv said, don't think about offense when you're designing your defense. Um, if your best left side is also your best blocker, you better be putting them where the, the other team's best hitter is. Do you do very much of that in terms of moving my best blocker to any of the three positions, blocking positions along the net with the idea of I'm going to put her on the, the opponent's best hitter regardless of my, what my transition offense is going to subsequently if, look If like. I had that kind of a blocker, then I might, I might do that. Marv didn't coach a lot of women's volleyball. <laughs> right, good um, you got me there. Yeah. Um, 
there aren't a lot of great women blockers. I mean, and, and I tell our outside hitters that. I said, there's, there's not a good blocker in women's volleyball. Okay. So why are you getting blocked? Okay. Yeah, so, but, so you shouldn't be intimidated. You shouldn't be you know, trying to thread yeah. needles. I yeah, said, you yeah. go after the block. But, I mean, that's a, great, that's a great point. I don't think that... But for uh, the high school coach out yeah. there who only has one person above six foot, yeah. would, you, would you, or did you, because you've probably been in yeah. this position, well, sure. we don't care where you block. We'll figure out offense later, but we want you blocking first. Or did you kind of tend to keep I would, more of I would go the other way. Right. I, I would say at the high school level that I just don't think blocking, at least it wasn't then, and I'm sure that you get to the very elite level of high school volleyball, there's going to be those situations. And I think that's when you do it. I think in general, you don't. But when you're, when it's, um, you know, Mother Macaulay matched up with St. Francis or whatever, okay, and now, now that might be the time, okay, we're going to make sure we're going to put our big block out in front of their big outside hitter. So we're going to make those, that adjustment at that point in time. But I think in the general design of things, I think transition point scoring is too important to stick your, your left side player, who's also your best offensive player, over here in front of their left side hitter. Uh, I think it would make more sense the higher level you go right. and the more f efficient blocker so that you So you're saying uh, the club level, high school level, 90% of the matches can be won, again we're talking about design and defense, with good backcourt, good ball control in transition offense as opposed to having the block that would be my be belief your primary consideration. that would definitely be be my belief i just haven't now, seen would that that be reflected in how you design your practices then that you'd spend more time on ball control defense moving transition dig to yeah. kill type stuff as opposed to blocking drills but each year you've got to look at your team and i think that that's how you determine what you work on in practice i mean you don't pull last year's file of practice plans out and do it year after year. Um, every year is going to be different what you spend your time on. You, you may walk in the gym and realize your three best outside hitters graduated last year. So what are you gonna work on? Well, you're gonna, those guys are ball control players. They're, they're a big part of your offense. And right. so that's why you gotta put, put all of your time into that. But I think when I was coaching, especially trying to build up to an, a top level at the high school or club level, blocking was the least most important skill. The least. Now, once you all of a sudden you get to that point, now you're good in a lot of areas, but you're not blocking anybody, and, and that's the reason you're not, you know, maybe beating those top teams. Well, then you've got to start putting some more time in, in blocking. But I think it's, it was the last area of the six or seven primary skills that I would spend time on. Very good.